Hi there. So today I want to talk to you about scanning tunneling microscopy and some of the basics and fundamentals um, of this fascinating technique. So it's one of the handful of techniques that will give you true atomic resolution. So for example, lots of times in atomic force microscopy, you can see the periodicity of the lattice pretty easily, um, but it's difficult to get true atomic resolution. Now, how do you know that you've got true atomic resolution? Well, you can see point defects and differences between uh, the sample and atom to atom instead of just seeing the regular array of the lattice itself is what you often get with atomic force microscopy. So for an example of that, no, look no further than the two images in front of you right now. So the silicon 7x7 reconstruction is pictured here on the left. The 7x7 reconstruction is a specific phase that the silicon uh, material will go into uh, once it passes a temperature threshold. And you can see that the um, atoms are pictured as these kind of bright circles. They're like basically little balls. And you can see vacancies um, within the lattice um, and defects in the lattice. So you know you're getting true atomic resolution. And then here on the right, um, this is a platinum nickel alloy. And so in this one, you can see that the, um, the platinum nickel uh, appear at different levels of gray. So some atoms appear brighter than the others, and then you also see uh, uh, point defects with larger uh, uh, images on the surface. Okay, So you're getting true atomic resolution in each of these images using scanning tunneling microscopy. And as we'll discuss, you can even get subatomic resolution sometimes with the STM if you put forth a lot of experimental effort. So how does this technique work? Well, STM, or scanning tunneling microscopy, in many ways is similar to AFM, or atomic force microscopy. You have a sharp probe tip that's raster scanned in a rectangular or square array over a surface at very short tip sample distances on the order of a nanometer or so. Now in AFM, you're monitoring a different signal for the feedback loop than you're monitoring in STM. In STM, the signal that you're monitoring for that feedback loop is your quantum mechanical tunneling current, which we'll discuss more in just a second. In the most common STM imaging mode, it's a piezoelectric scanner that's moving the tip up and down in response to try and maintain that constant current between the tip and the sample. And oftentimes, though not always, this maps the sample's morphology. All right? And so you can get atomic scale resolution with your STM in that way. Now, to remind you, quantum mechanical tunneling currents, um, and for this, I've borrowed several slides from this really great uh, website that I you know, recommend that you visit. This guy, the Hoffman Group, um, really explains uh, STM in a very accessible way. So electrons in isolated atoms live at specific discrete energy levels. And likewise, in a metal, the electrons also have to live at specific energy levels based on the landscape, the energy landscape of the metal. But the difference is, that in a macroscopic piece of metal, there are so many electrons that the energy level spacing gets very close together. The levels are so close together that it no longer makes sense to try to list all the energy levels of the electrons. So for example, in a macroscopic piece of metal, there's on the order of 10 to the 23 or greater electrons. Um, so instead, we're going to ask the question in a given energy uh, level or interval delta E around some energy or epsilon, how many electrons are there? And the electrons are going to, um, in a specific sample, fill up the energy valley in the sample until there's no more electrons. And the top energy level at which the electrons sit is called the Fermi level, just to give you some vocabulary here. So that's the uppermost occupied energy level is the Fermi level. So for every specific energy, we'll call it epsilon, the density of states, another important vocabulary word for uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, density of states, the density of states is the number of electrons that sits within some energy range delta epsilon around epsilon, okay? And so for example, in this little figure, he's shown the density of states as this little uh, width. So you would describe the density of states for that little delta epsilon energy width right there. And he shows all the little happy smiley electrons sitting within that valley uh, filling up to the Fermi level here. Okay? Now, electrons are happy sitting in either the tip or the sample. So if you approach your tip towards your sample, the electrons in the tip and the electrons in the sample are both equally happy. Okay? They're sitting in these nice energy valleys. 
and it would take energy to remove one of those electrons. You would have to give it enough energy to escape. In other words, the work function of the material. So we can think of the vacuum around the tip as an energy hill that the electron would need to climb in order to escape. And of course, the height of that energy hill is the work function often indicated with a phi. In order to bring the electron up and over the vacuum energy barrier from the tip to the sample, you'd have to supply a large amount of energy because climbing hills is hard work. But luckily for us, we know from quantum mechanics that the electron can tunnel right through that energy barrier. And that's the phenomenon that we're describing today. Now, even if the electrons can tunnel through the energy bar barrier, basically, if it's level on both sides, like it is in that cartoon, they have no place to go. Let's say that one of them tunnels over here to the other side. Well, all of these energy states right here are occupied, okay? So basically, in order to get a tunneling current going from one side to the other, you have to apply a bias voltage in between the tip and the sample. Okay, because as long as the tip and the sample are held at the same electrical potential, their Fermi levels line up exactly or too close to get a detectable tunneling current. There's no empty states on either side available for tunneling into, and that's why we apply a bias voltage between the tip and the sample. By applying that bias voltage to the sample with respect to the tip, for example, we effectively raise the Fermi level of the sample with respect to the tip, and then now we have these empty energy states available for tunneling into on the other side and you get this little happy guy tunneling through, okay? Now you might remember from Modern Physics 1 that um, you can get a tunneling current and the equation that describes that current will be proportional to e to the minus 2 kappa L, where kappa is equal to the square root of 2m u minus e divided by h bar. Now to define the variables here, L would be the width of the barrier, okay? This is a square barrier basically and L is the width of that barrier. u minus e is the height of the barrier in energy. Okay, so you have a certain energy for your electron E, you have a certain barrier height U, and then U minus E is the difference there. Okay, M is the mass of the electron. H bar is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, and then divided by 2 times pi. Okay, so this gives you the probability of tunneling, and then the probability of tunneling is proportional to the current I. Now, typical values that you might find um, are U minus E of about 4 electron volts, and then that um, oftentimes you'll get currents in a scanning tunneling microscope on the order of a nanoamp, although they can go down to as low as a picoamp, depending on what you're doing. Now this square barrier is an approximation that works um, for vacuums and for metal surfaces that are just separated by some distance apart. So this doesn't take into account the uh, geometry of the tip sample, for example, or the density of states. This is a very, very simple approximation. Okay, In a scanning tunneling microscope, the potential really wouldn't be that simple. So this is the square barrier approximation that I showed you from the previous equation. But if you apply a bias voltage, that's going to change um, the structure. It's going to tilt it. So you have an energy level on one side, a Fermi level that's higher on one side than the other. And of course, it's going to slant that barrier down. Okay. Um, and, uh, of course, there's still more information about the density of states that we'll get to in just a second. However, no matter what the complexities, we can still kind of look at that simple equation that we learned in Modern 1 and use it to understand some principles about STM. So, for example, look at the picture on the left. Um, that's a simulation of an atomically sharp scanning tunneling microscope tip. And the picture on the right is a simulation of the atomically sharp AFM tip. Now, of course, achieving an atomically sharp tip is actually kind of difficult, but let's set that aside for just a second. The STM is going to give true atomic resolution because the dependence of the tunneling current on that tip to sample separation is exponential. Okay, So what that means is that only the closest atom on a good STM tip is actually interacting with the closest atom on the sample. For example, in this little graphic it shows that 95% of the tunneling current is passing from this atom right here into the atom on the sample. So that's an atom to atom interaction. Okay, For atomic force microscopes, the dependence of the cantilever deflection on the tip to sample separation is weaker. It's not an exponential dependence, it's a linear dependence, right? And the result is 
that you can get an interaction uh, over a large area, cross-sectional area of your AFM tip. So it's more difficult to get true atomic scale uh, information out of an AFM than it is an STM because the uh, tip and sample are interacting over that larger cross-sectional area with multiple atoms, usually typically in an AFM. Now, here we have a schematic of um, tip sample tunneling. So basically, on the left-hand side, we have the sample density of states, and on the right-hand side, you have a little cartoon of the tip density of states, okay? Energies along the vertical axis, and then the density of states are on the horizontal axes. The filled states here are shown in green, and the empty states would be white. So in this case, what's happening is we're applying a negative bias voltage. A voltage has been applied to the sample, which effectively raises its Fermi level energy with respect to the Fermi level of the tip, and that allows for tunneling from the sample into the tip, and then that tunneling current is measured by um, uh, an external circuit. Now, there's a few things to think about. The density of states you can see on the left from the sample has a rather intricate structure. And so you have a higher density of states at some energies than others, okay? That means that there'd be more electrons available for tunneling as you ramp through that bias voltage. So if instead of uh, maintaining a constant bias voltage and moving your tip across the sample, if instead of doing that, you hold your tip in one spot, and ramp that bias voltage, say from minus 10 volts to plus 10 volts or whatever, right? While you hold your tip in place, the tunneling current between the tip and the sample is going to go up and down in magnitude in response to the availability of the electrons um, for tunneling, as is shown here in this density of states. So you'll get bobs and dips in your tunneling current. Basically, what you're doing if you do that is you're taking an energy level spectrum, okay? You're mapping the density of state as you ramp through that energy, and that's spectroscopy, okay? Now, this density of states um, is proportional to the current, and you can see here there's a little proportionality constant out front here that would, of course, change as your bias voltage changes. Now, this is what a typical STM spectrum might look like, okay? So here we have a plot of the tunneling current I versus the bias voltage applied V. There's a couple of general trends that we should discuss that are maybe not quite so interesting as the real interesting meaty stuff. But anyway, you can see that the magnitude of the current goes up as the magnitude of the bias voltage goes up. This is not at all surprising, okay? You should see more net electrons tunnel through as you raise that um, energy of the electrons up as you move the Fermi levels with respect to one another. That's not at all surprising. You also see the current switching direction as the bias voltage goes from positive to negative. So in other words, all that positive to negative means is that instead of going from the sample to the tip, maybe the electrons are in net traveling from the tip to the sample. Okay, also not surprising and relatively straightforward. That's why most of the time when you're taking an STM spectrum, what people will do is instead of plotting I versus V, they want to get to the interesting stuff. They want to see these little bumps right here, which are due to a changing density of states um, in their sample. So what they'll do is they'll take a derivative and they'll plot DI dV versus V. And then they get something that looks like this curve here on the bottom. And that's typically what you see. Now the little bumps are due to changing density of states from that cartoon that we saw earlier. And that gives you the uh, sort of diagram, energy level diagram, if you will, for the metal, okay? And so this is what an STM spectrum looks like. And you can use it to tell the differences between metals in your sample or between the metal in a semiconductor and so on and so forth. So you can extract a lot of information, chemical information, about your sample from looking at these STM IV curves. Now, it's worth noting that an STM, a typical one, can operate in two operating modes. The first is constant current, which we've talked about, which is you maintain a constant tunneling current as you scan your tip across the sample, and then your tip will move up and down to maintain that constant current. But you can also choose constant height mode. And in constant height mode, basically, you just hold your tip at a certain Z fixed position, and then you scan it in X and Y across the sample. And then what's plotted in your image is the changing tunneling current as you do that. 
Now this mode can be really great because it can provide better contrast for atomic scale imaging. You're really plotting that density of states and that gives you more contrast. That's in, illustrated here in the cartoon. The one on the left is a constant height image and you're plotting your current and you can see a lot of bumps in the current in response to the change of the density of states um, on of the electrons on the sample. Whereas on the right, you know, if you're doing it in constant current mode, basically you're seeing most of the time changing topography of your sample. And of course, if you're in an atomically flat um, area, that topography is not going to change very much. Um, so you'll get more contrast maybe in a constant height mode than you would in constant current mode. But you've got to be careful, okay? You've got to first scan the surface in a constant current mode and make sure that you really are on an atomically flat region um, and that your sample's not tilted or anything else like that is going on because you might crash your tip, which basically means that, you know, your tip sees a bump or something in the surface and instead of being able to retract and get over that bump of time, it just plows right through it. And of course, that's a tip crash, which is bad for STM imaging. It's also so unfortunately, really super common. Now, here's an image. What we um, talked about with STM spectroscopy is really fascinating, but you might also think about the fact that sometimes in STM images, you're not necessarily seeing just topography, but you're also seeing the density of states for the electrons in the surface. What that means is that you can actually image S, um, electron orbitals because the density of states for the electron is going to be different depending upon what the orbitals for the um, atoms in the electron are like. Okay, so this has been done. Okay, uh, here's a reference right here. This shows the shape of some of the electron orbitals that have been verified experimentally using STM. Um, and they did this with a tungsten tip and they reproducibly acquired STM images demonstrating a regular lattice for some subatomic features. Okay, so this is a simulation of what those orbitals should look like and this is what they actually got. And of course that could be due to sort of in-plane, out-of-plane uh, motion of those atoms, um, so or placement of the atoms. And so you can see subatomic uh, features and using the, uh, for example, the constant height mode, you can map out those density of states and it can show up in an image, which is super fascinating. Now, what would you have to do to get images like that? Well, it's really not easy and it's not cheap. I'll tell you that right now. What you have to do, step number one, is you have to have an isolation from mechanical vibrations. People walking by outside, uh, somebody driving a, a big truck by out on the street out there. You've got to isolate for those vibrations because of course the vibrations that could be caused in your building from something like that would be of a larger amplitude of oscillation than the atoms that you're trying to see. Okay, Atoms are incredibly small and of course you can get vibrations if I knock on this table table right here, for example, then I'm causing vibrations all throughout the system of me and the table that are much larger than one atom. Okay, so you have to isolate for that. There's different ways that you can do it. We'll discuss some of those in uh, future lectures, but you can have, for example, an air table where this table itself is resting on a cushion of pressurized air and that helps isolate. You can use bungee cords or springs. There's different ways of doing it. You can also just have a really super heavy system and that helps isolate it too because the, the weight of the system holding it down damps out those mechanical vibrations. You also need to have it isolated from noise, okay? Just me talking is vibrating the atoms at a certain amplitude. And so you'd need to have your system isolated from noise. You'd also, of course, need to have your system electrically isolated. The currents that you're measuring from the tip to the sample are incredibly small, and if you have noise in the building from the electronics, um, anything like that, then that could interfere with the sample uh, the uh, tunneling current signal and you're going to get crap. You also need your system to be very thermally stable and if you're going to image subatomic stuff often really super cold liquid helium temperatures for example and that's because if your atom is just sitting there within its lattice at room temperature it's not just sitting there it's going like this it's really oscillating at what would be a high amplitude compared to the size of 
of the orbital that you're trying to see, okay? You're trying to look at something that's less than 10 to minus 10 meters, for example, and the amplitude of oscillation for most things at room temperature or reasonable temperatures is, is just way above that, okay? So you need to have your things really chilled and cold in order to see something like that. And you'd also need to see uh, no contaminants. And so that would mean that you'd have to have the whole system in ultra high vacuum. I remember a rule of thumb that my um, PhD uh, advisor Jackie Krim told me, and she said that at 10 to the minus 6 torr, which is a unit of pressure, atmospheric pressure is 760 torr, for example. At 10 to the minus 6 torr, which would be, what is that, 8 orders of magnitude below atmospheric pressure, you get about one monolayer of crap, you know, whatever's in the air, water, carbon, crap, one monolayer of crap depositing on your surface every second. And then it changes um, as you go down in powers of 10. So for example, it would take 10 seconds for one monolayer of crap to deposit at 10 to the minus 7 torr, 100 seconds at 10 to the minus 8, and so forth. And so these systems that they are using to image these, um, these subatomic uh, things in STMs, they're on the order of 10 to the minus 10 torr, um, at least 10 to the minus 9 torr, in order to uh, get those images. Otherwise, you're not imaging the surface that you're interested in. You're imaging the contaminant layer that's on top of it, which is not what you want. So what do systems like that end up looking like? Well, here's an example, okay? This is from the Nano Lino Group, Nano Lino Group. I don't know how they say it. Um, it's in Switzerland. It's headed by Ernst Meyer, who I've actually met before at a few conferences, and it's at the University of Basel in Switzerland. So this is an ultra high vacuum STM that is capable of very low temperature uh, operation in ultra high vacuum and everything. So this is what those STMs look like. Um, they're super expensive. You can expect to spend probably at least half a million dollars, if not a million dollars, to get a system that looks like this. They're also super heavy, by the way. Um, nobody told me when I entered nanoscience that I was going to be entering a field where I had to do a lot of heavy lifting. That seems counterintuitive, but it's true. So this is your system. Um, there's a vibration isolation, I'm sure, in there, and this is all pumped out in an ultra high vacuum, which explains all the stainless steel and nuts and bolts. Okay, so this is what those systems look like. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and learned a little something. Um, and uh, that's STM basics.